So hi everyone, my name is Christy Sullivan and um, I'm a graduate student at Florida International University and I'm working under Dr. Evelyn Geyser. And for the past two years, I've been visiting Archbold's Lake Annie and looking at some of the drivers of phytoplankton community assembly as they relate to changes in dissolved organic carbon concentration in the lake. So brownification is a phenomenon um, which affects lakes around the globe. And um, brownification, for those of you who haven't heard of this word before, is an increase in color dissolved organic carbon within a lake, which causes it to turn a sort of tea color, like this picture in the bottom right hand corner. And some causes of brownification have been linked to recovery from acid deposition, long term changes in land use change, and altered precipitation patterns. And brownification is important to study because it seems to have a lot of ecosystem consequences. Um, it alters the lake environment by altering light penetration and thermocline depth. And this can cause lower productivity, lower biodiversity, as well as lower fish and invertebrate production. So uh, a lot of these ecosystem consequences begin with algae which is what I'll be talking to you about today. Um, precipitation patterns can be driven by teleconnections. These are global phenomenons which um, affect precipitation. So you may have heard of El Nino, La Nina, um, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. These are all examples of teleconnections. And in relation to these global teleconnections, lakes may fluctuate between periods of high and low water stage um, or brown and clear water, as we've seen in Lake Annie. So this figure in the bottom left-hand corner is from um, some previous work done on Lake Annie, which shows that the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation is strongly linked to long-term changes in water color within the lake. So, um, from 1984 to the late 90s, the lake was actually much clearer than it is right now. And this was due to long-term decreases in precipitation driven by an AMO cool front. And then as we moved into an AMO warm phase, um, precipitation became generally more intense and more variable. So the lake turned brown um, photic depth was much lower, and you'll also see that thermocline depth, which is these sort of warmer color lines, was also much shallower in the summer months. Um, so seasonal phytoplankton succession tends to be more predictable in high latitude or altitude dimictic lakes, and this is because these lakes have uh, harsher winter conditions or periods of ice cover, which acts as a strong reset to phytoplankton seasonal dynamics. Um, so if you've ever looked at a general chart of phytoplankton seasonality, this is sort of what you'll see. Following uh, the ice off period in the late winter to early spring, there's usually a bloom of diatoms or small silica flagellates. And then as we move into late spring or early summer, green algae become dominant. And then in the late summer or early fall, again, there could be another bloom of diatoms or if it's eutrophic lake, uh, you could get a nasty cyanobacteria bloom. And then in the fall, dinoflagellates become dominant. So because tropical and subtropical lakes don't have these harsh winter conditions, temperatures are more stable year round, um, phytoplankton dynamics could be more strongly influenced by the differences in wet dry season hydrology. And if hydrology is not strongly different between the wet and dry seasons, um, this annual pattern of phytoplankton succession could be less repeatable and differ from this textbook model I've shown you here. So getting into my study site, which is Lake Annie, um, 
This is a low nutrient warm monomictic lake. And while its surface area is pretty small, it has a maximum depth of 21 meters, which is fairly deep. As I previously mentioned, the lake experiences natural fluctuations in water color in relation to the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. We have a 35-year water quality record for the lake and a 14-year monthly phytoplankton record, which are the data I'll be discussing today. So um, one of the main questions going into my thesis was, how does Lake Annie fit into a global context? And um, because rainfall variability is increasing across the globe, this makes me wonder if regional hydrology could become a more important driver of phytoplankton succession in temperate lakes, as opposed to um, the strong winter conditions we see now. My first hypothesis is that phytoplankton composition will differ between dark and clear years in lakes with colored dissolved organic carbon oscillations. So in Lake Annie, seasonal succession could be more apparent in the dark phases due to um, stronger differences in wet, dry season rainfall. And then, then in the clear phases when there's not as much of a distinction between wet, dry season rainfall, um, these phytoplankton patterns may be less repeatable. And I believe these differences in dark and clear phase phytoplankton assemblages will largely be due to differences in phytoplankton functional traits. Um, so for the 14 year period where uh, we have phytoplankton data, um, I broke the time series up into a dark, clear, and dark phase. And this was based on changes in water color. Um, and I decided to use platinum cobalt units as a measure of water color instead of dissolved organic carbon, because not all dissolved organic carbon is colored, though these two metrics are highly correlated. So dark phases were considered periods where water color was greater than 30 platinum cobalt units, and then clear phases were considered periods where water color was less than 30 platinum cobalt units. Um, moving forward, phytoplankton taxa were also expressed as relative biovolume. And uh, I, con I conducted a variety of multivariate analyses and functional group analyses. So getting into some of the phytoplankton relative biovolume trends, um, one of the first thing I noticed was that the phytoplankton responses to the changes in water color were actually quite delayed. The um, initial change from dark to clear phase based on the changes in water color and then the phytoplankton response, this lag time was about two years. And then from the clear phase moving into the second dark phase, the lag time was much shorter, only about one year, which suggests that the phytoplankton community is more sensitive to um, these transitions to darker periods. Um, one of the most obvious things I saw was that diatoms almost completely disappeared during the clear phase. You'll see here their numbers are quite low. And that's pretty unheard of. Um, and so that made me wonder what was going on there. And I'll get into some of the possible explanations for that a little later. I also noticed that this corresponded with an increase in relative biovolume of ochrophytes during the clear phase. And again, I'll get into some of the possible reasons for that trade-off a little later. This is a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling ordination. Um, and it looks a little intimidating, but if you've never seen one of these plots before, basically the way to interpret it is that each of these points represents a phytoplankton sample um, for a respective month in a dark or clear year. And points that are closer together represent phytoplankton samples that are more similar in composition and points that are further apart represent phytoplankton samples that are more dissimilar. So 
Um, I saw a strong grouping of phytoplankton assemblage samples in the dark and then another grouping in the clear years. And these differences were largely due to um, vectors indicating changes in water clarity and nutrients. Getting into some of the seasonal differences in phytoplankton communities between dark and clear years. Um, these are again NMDS plots, but now each point is representing a phytoplankton sample um, from a month within the example year. So you'll see for a typical dark year, um, starting here at this January origin point, there the phytoplankton community sort of makes this nice circle. And by December, um, the phytoplankton community is most similar to that January origin point. Whereas in a clear year, um, by December, the phytoplankton community is more different from the January origin point. Um, so this suggests that in dark years, there is some tendency for phytoplankton succession to repeat whereas in clear years, phytoplankton succession is less repeatable. So these are two revisualizations re of that original NMDS plot I showed you. Um, but this time, the size of the point represents the relative proportion of the respective functional group. So um, group two, which are cyanurophytes, such as Malmonas and cyanura, um, these guys were more prominent in the clear phase, whereas diatoms were more prominent in the dark phase. And um, this is the trade-off I was talking about earlier. Both of these groups actually use silica, so it seems that there's some sort of competition going on between this silica resource between the dark and clear phases and these two functional groups. Unfortunately, we didn't measure silica um, over this time period, but um, that, would, well, that would definitely be something interesting to look into, and I think something we should monitor for on this lake moving forward. So to conclude, hydrologic and physical chemical shifts promoted two distinct algal assemblages, which were the dark phase and clear phase assemblages. And while dark years tended to follow the general successional trends um, seen in most temperate lakes, there was less seasonality in the clear phase assemblages, and they did not exhibit this textbook phytoplankton succession. Um, one of my other overarching questions was how applicable are these phytoplankton trends observed in Lake Annie to the future of temperate lakes? As I mentioned before, um, are diamictic, which means they mix twice per year in the spring and the fall. And due to climate change, they may begin to transition to a monomictic regime, regime mixing just once per year in the winter, which is more similar to what we see in Lake Annie. And this is going to lead to long, uh, increased winter light availability and longer mixing periods, which could increase winter phytoplankton productivity. However, temperate lakes do experience more seasonal variability in solar radiance. So this analog using Lake Annie uh, is likely going to work best for the future of lower latitude temperate lakes. Um, overall, I believe that in the absence of ice cover, regional precipitation could become more important in regulating phytoplankton seasonality in temperate lakes. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions or comments, or if you, if we are running out of time, you can always email me at ksell027 uh, at fiu.edu. And I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Evelyn, and the other guys or lab personnel, as well as Hillary Swain and Kevin Main for collecting most of these phytoplankton samples. <laughs>